How about the rest of you? Are you all ready to worship? Our guest tonight is the lovely and talented Shane Waltz running through. No, it's not really. We are expecting at any moment our guest tonight will be uh, Pastor Nate Nims from Waterloo First United Methodist Church. He's uh, running right down to the wire tonight. But we got music in the meantime from Fusion Funk. That's Covet Oswald playing that 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 thing tonight. And of course we got our host, the lovely and talented Mr. John Cooper. And that was his cue. <laughs> Welcome to Fusion Tonight. I'm your host, John Cooper. How are we doing tonight? Woo! Closing out the season. It's our last show before Christmas break, guys. So Merry Christmas. I'm giving you a break from me. <laughs> <laughs> so not a lot has been going on in my life. It's been pretty steady. Avery's settling in. We're trying to get him to sleep through the night now. He's not doing that. <laughs> but we're trying. But there is, there is one thing I was going to bring up, and I'm sure uh, other dads can attest to this. I didn't realize it before I was a dad, but I realize it now. Not every men's restroom where you go has a changing table, yeah. and this is awful. This is awful news because they're, sometimes you're just there, and you're like, all right, we're just, I guess we do it on the floor. We, we can try to do it standing up it's terrible so if i there's not really a joke here just a plea please put changing tables in men's bathrooms because i'm tired of looking confused when i go in there and as a suggestion i would put them right in the handicap stall it's a big open stall it would be easy to put in and it would be fitting because having children is a handicap uh <laughs> they hold you it is <laughs> I am a handy yeah, I'm a handicap for my wife and Avery is a handicap for the both of us. It makes going places very difficult. So no joke, just more changing tables. I too like wiping butts and I don't want Gabby to have all the fun by herself. <laughs> all right, well it's the last show. We're getting into the Christmas season. It's really exciting. Nate is not here yet, but when he gets here, it's going to be great, I promise you, which is probably why I'm stalling like please show up. <laughs> yes, Violet, tell a joke. That'll be a good way to wrap up. Because, Do it. Do it. How many cats does it take to dress a Christmas tree? Oh, that's perfect. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we do have a great service for you tonight. I am super excited. Nate Nims is going to be here. He's going to knock our socks off. But in the meantime, give it up for Mr. COVID Oswald. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and I thought I was long-winded. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> we are now going to go into our open mic time, which looks a lot like Joy's Concern. So this is your chance to share whatever's on your heart, your mind, anything you want to lift up uh, in prayer or just to 
just to share aloud. So does anyone have anything that they would like to share tonight? All right, well, I'll close. I want to, I don't know if it's more of a prayer or just an observation, but I've been watching some of the funeral service for former President George H.W. Bush, and I was, it was, I was very moved by a lot of the eulogies and just the, the respect from all across political lines that everyone seemed to have for him. And it reminded me of just how much good there is in the world because we, we act like there's so much division and here was a man and everyone seemed to come together to really uh, celebrate him. And it reminded me of, of how great we can all be, not as just as Americans, but just as people and, and as servants of God. Uh, former President Bush, he was very, uh, very faithful. He was a very loving and kind person. And I understand that maybe not everyone agrees politically and that's okay, but he was just so revered, it felt like, because he just approached life with such kind, some such kindness and compassion. And when we have a chance to be in positions of leadership where people are following us, and as we're trying to get people to follow Christ, that type of kindness and compassion that inspires people and gives them hope is sorely needed. So uh, prayers to the Bush family, and whether you agreed with his politics or not, can we, maybe we can all aspire to be the type of person that um, leaves behind a legacy of, of empathy and compassion in the, ways that they, in the ways that they lead in whatever ways that those present themselves. So uh, with that, if there's no other prayers, let us go ahead and bow our heads in a time of prayer. Gracious and Holy Father, we ask that as we gather in this space for the final time this season, that you hear all of the prayers, all of the worries, and all the concerns that we carry in our hearts. We ask that you allow us to give those worries to you so that we are not burdened down by fear. We are not burdened down by things that might anger us or by things that might scare us. May we give life's uncertainties to you so that we don't have to carry the burden of what we don't know, so that we can instead focus on the things that we do know. And Lord, the things that we do know is that you are a just and a loving God. You are there for us through every walk of our life. Every step that we take, you are right beside us. No, how many, no matter how many times we might fall down or mess up or make a mistake, we know that your love is unwavering. Your love is unconditional. You never withhold yourself from us, no matter what we've done, no matter who we are in any moment. You are there for us always with your arms open, waiting for us to come to you, to rest in your love, to find a sense of hope and comfort so that we can find a way to find comfort within ourselves and love within ourselves so we can share that love with others around us. As we head into the Christmas season and as we head into a time where we celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, who came to this world not to condemn it, but to save it through him with love, with grace, with an example of the highest amount of compassion and empathy for our fellow man. May that spirit that he showed us be a spirit we carry with us, not just through this season, but with us always. Through every trial and tribulation, may we be reminded of how together we are and how loved we are and how much we can truly be able to love one another. And as we pray for these things, we do so with the prayer your son Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right, he showed up, so whew, <laughs> disaster averted. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited. He is our guest and our speaker tonight, and I'm so excited to have him come up. Uh, I met him a couple years ago uh, after well, the first time, I guess, formally he had preached uh, during Transformation for us. And uh, I remember being in church, 
and you know, we're kind of reflecting on a sermon, and we're talking about everything in life, and trying to find what we have uh, in common with each other. And as we're sitting in the church thinking on Jesus Christ, we realized that both of us had this shared, profound love of professional wrestling. And uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, he invited me to watch the Royal Rumble with him that night, and it was the best night ever. Uh, but it's the kind of guy that he is. He is someone that loves the silly things like professional wrestling, but he also is a, someone that loves the serious and the big picture things like Jesus Christ. And I'm so excited to talk to him tonight and then listen to him preach as he wrestles with things in the gospel. Please give it up for the pastor over at First United Methodist Church in Waterloo, Pastor Nate Nims. You made it. I made it, yes. Like yeah. Stone Cold Steve Austin, after 10 o'clock is hit and you think he's not showing up, you busted through the glass. The glass breaks, you run in. Yeah. That's, that's Nate Nim's music. He has arrived. So I'm so glad you made it. So um, I introduced you as the uh, pastor at First United Methodist Church in Waterloo. So why don't you tell everybody how long you have been assigned there and you've been preaching to the folks over at our sister church? Uh, I've been at Waterloo First for six years now. Six years. Yeah. Is this your first appointment as a this pastor? Is my second. second. I was down in Fairfield before coming up here. All right. Well, you seem so young. The idea that you've already got two churches under your belt yeah. seems seems like a stretch. You don't even have. By, I, so I just turned 34, but by United Methodist clergy standards, I'm still a young adult. So that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on to that as long as you can. So, 34, you're on your second appointment. What first got you thinking about going into ministry? Uh, so, my, my dad's a pastor, uh, somewhat retired, works part-time at Grace in Des Moines. And when I was in middle school, I was at a camp at Pictured Rock, and folks were talking about, uh, it was a service on calling and vocation and what you're going to do with your life. And... There's a little moment in there where they said, like, some of you will be doctors, some of you will be teachers, some of you will be pastors. And when they said pastors, I'm like, oh, yeah, that will be what I do. <laughs> and then because I was in middle school, and I've yet to meet a middle schooler that really, really wants to be what their parent wants to be, I had this moment of thinking, no, that'll never be me. But a deep sense of that will be. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't want to follow that call for a long time. Um, went to Simpson for my undergrad thought I would do psychology maybe or something like that, social work, didn't really connect with those departments, but I had a religion professor in a class that was called Jesus. Um, it was a class on the Synoptic Gospels, and the best part of that class was, since it was called Jesus, you could say, Jesus is really upsetting me today, or I just don't <laughs> want to see Jesus this afternoon, or Jesus gives too much homework. Um, so that was, that was a, a fun joke that we had. Um, but we were, we were talking about parables one day in that class, and um, we did the parable of the shrewd manager. And since my dad's a pastor, always through Sunday school confirmation, I could give an answer, and none of my teachers would tell me I was wrong, because then I would tell my dad, Right? Like, clearly yeah. the pastor's kid knows the right answer, and it's always Jesus, grace, or love. So, <laughs> like, it's just not hard. Yeah. But I gave, like, that answer to the shrewd manager about what that parable was about, and the professor said no. I was like, huh, maybe I can think about this again. Um, so it really got connected to that, that community and that department and went to seminary not entirely sure I would end up in the local church. Um, but the first year that I worked in, in, in Fairfield, um, even with all the sort of unseen chaos that comes from pastoring, it I knew it was the right thing for me to do. Well, awesome. Well, I, for one, am glad that you answered that call. Uh, I've listened to you preach a couple of times now. You're clearly in the right profession, so I'm glad that you went that route. What would you say, uh, and you know, it really isn't that long of a time that you've been doing this because you still are very young. 34 is young. 40 is the new 30. So, like, yeah. you're very young. 
And if that makes somebody who is 40 feel good out there, you're welcome. Um, what would you say is the best part of being a pastor? What moves you or what uh, validates your decision to answer the call the most being a pastor? Yeah, it's, it's different like each day. Um, so today it was visiting somebody in the hospital and, um, you know, they're, they're getting close to the end of their life, but knowing, um, how I've been able to be with them over the past few years and sharing a moment with this woman and with, with her daughter. And then another church member came while we were doing that visit and just the time that we were able to share together, um, even though there's, there's a, a bit of sadness there, there's also the the joy and the love and the, the fellowship that we've shared um, and the, the faith that lets us know that it's, it's all right. Um, so that was, that was that moment today. Yesterday it was, you know, somebody came to the church. Um, we're downtown Waterloo, so we get a lot of folks that come to us looking for assistance in different ways. And sometimes we're able to help pay a bill. Yesterday we weren't, but we've got a, uh, a free pantry and a free library. So we always have uh, supplies for folks, and um, we give out a ton of toilet paper, toothbrushes, and deodorant. Because if folks are on SNAP or WIC, um, those are supplies that you can't get with those programs. So somebody came to us with a need. We couldn't meet that, but we said, we can send you home with more than enough of what we can help you out, and was able to spend some time with them and get to know them, and yeah being able to, to have that, that connection. So it's well, just something every day. Well, that's awesome. I'm, I'm super glad that you're in the, doing what you're doing. Um, I love the work that you do, and I love getting to chat with you. So I'll close uh, this part of the interview because I want to hear you preach really bad. Uh, I introduced you as someone that does, like, professional wrestling. Is that something you, your congregation knows about, or are you afraid yes. that they – Okay. Oh, they, they know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they oh. judge me, but they know. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, I hope they know that if we were comparing pastors in terms of wrestling shows, I would say Joel Osteen is Monday Night Raw. Yeah. And you are NXT. Mm. That's a good one. I, yeah. I, I you guys don't that. get it, but, but no, I just, that's, I that's basically solid. gave him the yeah. highest compliment I could possibly give him yeah. in wrestling language. So, Nate, thank you so much for... For being here, we're going to do offering, and then after that, we are going to hear you preach what would be your last sermon. So, super excited. So, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Nate Nims. All right, we are now going to do our offering time, and normally we would start a new one every month, but because we're only doing this once this month before break, we are going to continue with donating to the food bank. Uh, I mentioned... Uh, when we started, we were doing this to raise enough money for meals around Thanksgiving, and because of the efforts of this church, we were able to provide over 3,100 meals uh, based on what we donated. So that's a huge testament to the giving community that we have here. Um, the food bank is such a wonderful uh, organization, even outside of Thanksgiving. It's just always wonderful to provide others, everything that we can. So during offering, we have two giving jars on uh, each side of the room. So during the song, this is your chance to stand up, stretch, make a donation. Uh, whatever your heart calls you to give, we ask you to give it. This is your time for offering. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our main event, preaching if this was his last sermon. Once again, the pastor from First United Methodist Church in Waterloo. Give it up for Pastor Nate Nims. So in, in getting ready for this, what I was thinking was um, less, less what I would say and more what I hope people would remember from everything else I've said. And what that comes down to is the faith that God has in us and the trust that God has in you. And so we're, we're going to look tonight throughout the scriptures and see what God says about you and what God really says about us. So I want to start in Mark chapter 2. Early in the Gospel of Mark, they write, Jesus went through the wheat fields on the Sabbath. As the disciples made their way, they were plucking the heads of wheat. The Pharisees said to Jesus, look, 
Why are they breaking the Sabbath law? Jesus said to them, Haven't you read what David did when he was in need and when he and those with him were hungry? During that time when Abathar was the high priest, David went into God's house and ate the bread of presence, which only the priests are allowed to eat. And David also gave bread to those who are with him. So in this scene, uh, Jesus and his friends, they're out for a walk on the Sabbath. And the disciples, they start to get a little hungry. So they're walking through this field and they pick some wheat from the stalk. And the Pharisees, they come along and they see the disciples doing this. And they treat the disciples like kids that have their hand in a cookie jar, right? Like they make this big deal out of it. These Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they come along to the disciples and say, like, you know the rules and you're breaking them. You have to be chastised for that. You have to be shamed for that. You're not doing things the right way. You're sinners, so stop it. The disciples, they feel like I often felt when after school, my older sister would catch me eating extra snacks, right? Like she would come in and say, I'm going to call mom, you're in trouble. And I would just like shrink down because I knew I was actually in trouble, right? Like we have these moments where we feel shamed and lost. And I mean, not only are the disciples ashamed here, they're ashamed essentially for eating cereal without milk, right? Like if you're going to get in trouble, get in trouble for something interesting and worthwhile, right? Like if, if you're going to be shamed for something, make it, make it worth your time. But, but what interests me in this passage is how, is how Jesus responds because he says to the Pharisees, haven't you read what David did when he was in need and with those that were with him when he was hungry? There's two reasons I really, really love Jesus. One is that he's funny, and the second is that he calls people out. So he says to these Pharisees, whose job it is to read and interpret the law, the Bible, the scriptures, he says to these religious leaders that read the Bible every day, have you ever read the Bible? Have you ever read the stories of David and what he did? Like, he calls them out. Jesus says to the people that read the Bible every day, do you really know what you're reading? And those, those David stories, like, they, they aren't minor in the Old Testament, right? They're kind of a big deal. David is important, and the stories of David are big. And in this story of David, he was hungry, and he wanders into a temple, and there was this bread of presence, this showbread that was set aside only for the priest. It wasn't David's to eat, but he was hungry. He was in need, and so this bread was given to him, and then he shared this gift with others. Even though he didn't deserve this holy meal, he was gifted it and told it's okay. So Jesus asked the Pharisees, like, clearly you know this story. And if you know this, why are you still stuck in this narrow, judgmental mindset? Have you no grace left within you? Is there no room in your heart? These Pharisees seem to forget again and again that it's, it's not grace when we deserve it. It's grace when we have no other options. And there's this grace that comes, and Jesus shows them that you might have laws and traditions, but love, love will win. So in this story in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus compares himself to David, saying if God wasn't angry then, God clearly isn't angry now. It's, it's okay. So Jesus compares himself to David, but David fed his friends. So the disciples are compared to David's friends. So we should ask ourselves, well, how did David talk about his friends? So it's in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, we read about some of David's friends. And these, it's, it's written, these are the commanders of David's warriors. And that sounds a bit more impressive than companions, right? Like Chronicles makes it a big deal. So they helped to continue to support him while he was king. Together with all Israel, they made him king as the Lord had promised. This is the list of David's warriors. Joshobim the Hakmonite, which is just, if anyone is looking for a kid's name, there you go, right? Like, if you're going to be a mighty warrior, 
have a name that sounds like it because I'm sure that Bill and HR and Karen from accounting are really nice people, but they need a nickname if they're going to be epic and mighty, right? So Josh Obeam, the Hackmanite, is one of David's mighty friends. He was the commander of the 30. He raised a spear against 800, killing a killing them in a single occasion. Next came Eleazar, Dodo's son, the Ahohite. Again, another really cool name, right? He was one of those warriors. He was with David at Pastamine. And you all remember the Pastamine story, don't you? Right? That was better than Avengers 4 that hasn't come out yet, but will hopefully soon, right? They're, they're telling all these epic, amazing stories. And then First Chronicles continues. There was Benaniah, Jedahiah, son of Kazabel, a hero who performed many great deeds. He killed two of Moab's leaders. And on a snowy day, he went down into a pit and killed a lion. Yeah. Like, I don't know when you've been lion hunting, but it's a lot harder to hunt a lion on a snowy day. And you know what happens when you hunt a lion? Like, what are you going to do with all that? You give your partner a matching set of shoes for their purse, right? So, Merry Christmas to someone. Uh, but, they, they continue. There are, there are all these, in First Chronicles, these epic tales of David's friends, these mighty warriors. And they do things, looking back on them, they are, they are barbaric stories. They are violent stories. But they read them back then like they were the Justice League. They read them like they were the new Aquaman movie coming out. They were these epic tales that reminded us of how we can do amazing things. So Jesus and the disciples, they're just walking through this field, enjoying the day. They eat some grain because they're hungry. And the Pharisees try to shame them, saying, no, 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 you can't do that. But Jesus says, just calm down. There is grace here. And these, these friends of mine, they're like David's mighty warriors. They are doing great things. Jesus says to them, they're not just good. They're epic. He talks about his friends in this amazing way that says, we might have these rules, we might have these traditions, but more than that, we should never use these scriptures to beat one another down. It's all about how we can lift each other up and be who God says we are. Because too often... The Christian story, as it's told, begins with depravity and sin and loss and emptiness and pain. But that is not where God begins. Has anyone ever thought about the phrase original sin? It's a weird kind of phrase. Like, we use it to talk about how we're all born with either a God-shaped hole or some stain of sin within us. But how many of us have ever really sinned in an original way? Right? Like if you poke somebody's eye out with a beaver, that is a very original sin. <laughs> but like saying a white lie, not that original anymore. Right? So it's a weird, weird kind of phrase. Original sin as it may be, that's not where the Bible starts though. The Bible starts with joy and celebration. So in Genesis, in chapter 1, this story and this poetry unfolds where God creates and then God calls something good. God creates and then something is good and God creates humanity and then God says, this is very good. Everything in this opening passage of Genesis is goodness and joy and pleasure and grace. Genesis begins, the Bible begins with God saying, you are good. And if we miss that, we miss the rest of the story too. If we fail there, we can't take our faith any further. It's in the Gospel of John in chapter 14 that Jesus says, I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus says, you can do what I do and you'll do even more too. Jesus tells us, You'll, you can do this. I trust you. You will be amazing and you are more than you imagine. But if we beat ourselves up all the time, if we just call ourselves sinners that are lost in the hands of an angry God, if we just see ourselves as depraved, how can we see ourselves as what Jesus says we are? Jesus says, 
you are one of his epic friends. That's, we have to be careful with Jesus because he will, he will pull greatness out of you. He will inspire you to do what he's done and more. So in, in Exodus 19, it's just before the Ten Commandments are given, there's this covenant agreement that's, that mirrors a lot of the Jewish wedding ceremony. Um, and if you have questions about that, talk to Matt or Scott, because they can tell you all about that, and I don't have time for it tonight. But there's this whole story in Exodus of how the giving of the Ten Commandments are a marriage ceremony. It's about how God is saying, this is how we will live together. This is our our relationship. This is our covenant. This is our promise. Because God, God has always been looking for partners that will reflect goodness and joy. God has always been looking for people that will seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. God has always been looking for people to do this work with. And in Exodus 19 verse 5, God says, if you faithfully obey me and stay true to my covenant, you will be my most precious possession out of all the peoples, since the whole earth belongs to me. So when, when we live into this flow of grace and justice and joy, when we are people that witness to the love of God, we show others the divine. We are all called, you are called to be this witness to grace and peace because God trusts and God knows that you can do it. God doesn't think you are a tragic guest of your own existence. God thinks you are pretty special. God knows you can do this. And God has trusted you to do it. You are never cast aside. You are holy and loved. It's in 1 Peter that they write something that echoes those words from Exodus saying, You are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into God's amazing light. Once you were no people, but now, now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's this, this promise, this claim that you, you are here to live into that holy responsibility, to be these holy people. And that, that matters because when you hear church, what do you think? Right? Like when you hear church, do you think of revolutionaries that are changing the world? When you hear church, do you think of a holy calling that inspires the best of you to change the world? When you hear church finance meeting, do you think that is where the action is? <laughs> or when you hear church, do you think, oh, that's a nice thing that I do a couple times a week because I've been told my whole life that's a nice thing I should do a couple times a week? God is calling you to more because God thinks you are so much more than we often think we are ourselves. God wants the best of us because God believes in the best of us. So just after the Ten Commandments are given in Exodus 20, it's written that the people shook with fear and stood at a distance. They said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but don't, don't let God speak to us or we will die. And Moses says to them, don't be afraid. The people are standing at a distance, and how many times, how many times are we standing at a distance from ourselves, from one another, from, from God, because we're afraid to trust what God trusts in us? Jesus compares his disciples who lied, who cheated, who betrayed, who stole who were shamed, who were lost, who didn't always know what to do, who didn't trust themselves as much as Jesus trusted them. Jesus says, these guys who are eating grape nuts without milk are amazing. Don't shame them. But how, how shamed are we often feeling ourselves? Because we don't trust that Jesus really believes in us, that God trusts us. And when God sees us, God says, you are very good. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So my guess is, one way or another, we came here feeling like we were meek or mournful or maybe not worthy of this holy calling. But we all, no matter what, came here loved. Jesus says you can do this. Jesus says you are blessed. So how far are you going to take that blessing? If God believes in you and God trusts you, will you trust yourself? Will you believe in one another? Will you step into this holy calling that God has placed on your life? Because we, we can stand at a distance we can step back and be afraid, or we can remember that God says, you're good. You're very good. You'll do amazing things, and I'll always be with you. I, I don't think I'm the most tattooed pastor in the conference anymore. Uh, Andrew Bardol probably has me beat. He's down in Corning, Iowa. Um, but one of, my, one of my favorite tattoos is uh, Eucharist on the inside of my arm there. It's one of my newer ones, too. Um, and Eucharist, it's, it's used in the Gospel of Luke when Jesus is sharing the Last Supper. And it's two words that are put together. So E-U is good, and charist means gift or grace, depending on how you want to translate it. So in this meal, Jesus takes bread, breaks it, gives thanks to God, shares it with his disciples, and says, do this in remembrance of me. And then Christ takes the cup, gives thanks to God, shares it with the disciples and says, drink of this, all of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Christ breaks himself open and pours himself out and then invites us to do the same so that we might break our hearts open just as God's heart is open, that we might pour ourselves out and trust that in giving ourselves to others, God will put everything back together with grace. I, I put that there as a reminder, and maybe you don't need a tattoo to remember things, but I do. I put that there as a reminder that God trusts me to do this work. And if God trusts me, God definitely trusts you. Because I know what I've done. And it is more original sins than eating grape nuts. Right? Like I have done far worse things than plucking grain on the Sabbath. Jesus trusts those disciples and says they will do amazing things. He says you will do amazing things because God believes in you. God loves you. God made you very good. So if the last thing you ever hear is God believes in you, may you live like that is all you ever need to know. Because Jesus came so that you might know God and that you can trust the God that trusts in you. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Pastor Nate Nims. <laughs> Can't think of a better way to close the season. That is the end of the season. We now get to enter into a wonderful time of Christmas season, a time of giving, a time of reflection. And as you go forth into that season, may you take Nate's words with you and may you realize just how much God trusts you and loves you. The entire time he was speaking, I kept thinking of that phrase, love your, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And normally when I hear those words, I think of it as a golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated as a way to just love your neighbor. Listening to Nate talk tonight, love your neighbor and yourself. For God loves all of us so much that if you learn how to love yourself, that helps you love your neighbor. If you realize how special and wonderful you are, it helps you see the wonder and specialness of the person sitting next to you or across from you. So go forth knowing that God views us as masterpieces. 
We are created exactly how he wanted us to be created. We are not trash. We are not to wallow in sin or shame or regret. We are to rejoice that we are children of God. So take that love with you. Have a Merry Christmas, and I cannot wait to see you guys next year. And as you go forth, realize Christ loves you and use that to be Christ for one another. Thank you, and have a great season, guys. Mm -hmm.